My favorite thing about being a scientist is sometimes, a few times a year, I get to be the first human ever anywhere in the world to know something because I'm the one who found it. And then the next part of my job is to tell everyone else what I found and why I think it's so cool. That never gets old. The New School. The new school. The new school. This is The New School with your host, Christine Hong. Welcome to a new kind of school where we talk about career paths you don't normally get to hear about in the classroom. Every episode, I talk to someone with an interesting life path and learn about how they got to where they are today. Hey guys, happy Monday. I'm your host, Christine Hong, and today we're covering a topic many, many people have listed as their greatest fear, sharks. I've always been so curious about the public's strong fascination with these creatures. There's so many movies featuring them like Jaws, and every year I'm completely taken aback by the online obsession with Shark Week. Today we're going to interview someone so in a shark, he made it his career. Dr. Schiffman is a marine biologist who focuses on shark and ocean conservation, and people are listening. He has more than 50,000 followers on his Twitter handle, Why Sharks Matter. In this episode, we talk about how David turned his passion for sharks and the ocean into his career as a marine biologist, what conservation research is really like, his thoughts on who he thinks should become a marine biologist, and how he really feels about Shark Week. So how did you start getting interested in marine biology? I am one of those lucky few who's sort of always known what I wanted to be when I grow up. I've been spending this pandemic zooming around to school groups that are still meeting virtually. And I have to always stress when I talk to little kids that I've known what I wanted to do since I was younger than you. That doesn't mean you're bad if you don't know yet. But I have always known that I'm interested in the ocean in general and sharks specifically, as long as my family can remember. There are pictures of me as a toddler with shark toys and shark t-shirts. I went to marine biology camp in elementary school and middle school. My parents used to be able to park me at the shark tank at the Pittsburgh Zoo. Even though I grew up pretty far from the ocean, Pittsburgh is pretty far inland. I've always known that I love the ocean and I love marine biology. And my parents have always been very supportive, though I suspect they thought I would grow out of it eventually. But do you have a first memory of remembering becoming into the ocean or sharks? I really don't. It's just sort of always been there. And I feel like most kids go through a shark thing or a dinosaur thing. And I actually had both of those at the same time. And I had to pick one. And I thought I would enjoy my life more if I was out on a boat in the Caribbean looking for sharks than if I was out in the deserts of Montana looking for dinosaur bones. And philosophically, I also like the idea of helping to prevent species from going extinct more than I like the idea of studying extinct species. How old were you when you made that decision? Elementary school. I'm not sure exactly. But wow, you were very philosophical in elementary yeah. school. So you already decided you wanted to help conservation mm -hmm. back then. Why do you like oceans so much? Well, the oceans are critically important to humans as well as to biodiversity. They're a source of food for billions, including many of the poorest people in the world. They're a source of employment for tens of millions, including many of the poorest people in the world. They're where life started. There's a lot of important things to humans that come from the ocean, more than what you'd expect. The enzyme that's being used in these COVID-19 diagnostic tests came from deep sea organisms. All the PCR that's done for anything did. So the ocean is a fascinating place. Uh, there's tons of great literature and poetry about the, why the ocean is just magical and inspiring and so big and so vast and it makes you feel small. I just think it has a lot of cool stuff in it. And I've always uh, liked getting to explore it. I got scuba certified as soon as I was able. And my dad did too. And we eventually convinced my brother to get scuba certified as well. My wife still isn't, but she loves snorkeling when we travel. So I've just always loved the ocean and sharks in particular. What I love about sharks is I've seen thousands of them on five continents at this point, And I still get just as excited every time I see one as I did the first time I saw one when I was a toddler at the Pittsburgh Zoo Shark Tank. That's awesome. What a blessing to know what you want to do your whole it life. It has its perks. It also makes me very easy to shop for. You can see uh, all the different shark print stuff I have and lots of stuff on my desk from Zooming with schools. I'm not very familiar with different types of ocean type jobs, but why did you settle on marine biologists? I have just always been curious about the ocean and learning that sharks are really, really important to a healthy functioning ocean and that many species are in trouble and that there are things that people can do to help that they're not doing. 
seems like a pretty worthy avenue for professional research working now at the intersection of a science and conservation policy. So I live and work in Washington, D.C. as a conservation biologist, and some of my time is spent doing research out in the field, gathering data, and some of my time is spent talking with government agencies or talking with lawmakers or talking with the environmental nonprofit community here. There's not a lot of people who do science and policy and public education and communications. So it's a busy place to be. And there's definitely a lot to do. And it's very rewarding. I meet a lot of really cool people. But I love my job. That's awesome. Okay, so you're a kid. You decide, I'm not going to do dinosaurs. I want to become a marine biologist. How did you start to get there? Like, what did you do next? I talked to my science teachers in elementary school, and they mostly said, like, oh, that's nice, kid. We're going to make a paper mache volcano at the end of the year, maybe. But there were some that were great. I went to the library and got every book that I could find on sharks and marine biology in the ocean. I watched every documentary I could get my hands on. Again, the zoo was really important. And I eventually got to work there and help feed the sharks, which was awesome. And as soon as I was old enough, I went to scuba camp and marine biology camp in the Florida Keys, sea camp. And I later ended up working there after I graduated from college as the shark biology teacher. Uh, It was a pretty linear path, not a lot of twists and turns along the way. Uh, I know a lot of people have great stories about how they ended up where they are. I basically did the stereotypical path for pursuing academia, going to a college at a place where you do research, then going to graduate school, then doing a postdoc, and I'm a postdoc now. Do you think the major you have in college matters for grad school? It definitely matters. But for people interested in marine biology specifically as a career, you're generally advised not to major in marine biology. You want a broader education generally. So I majored in biology in general. I took a lot of marine biology electives, but learning things about non-marine biology biology was helpful in becoming a better rounded scientist. Also taking environmental science classes and environmental policy classes has been very helpful. But yeah, generally, I would say most marine biologists didn't major in marine biology. They majored in definitely science and usually biology, but you specialize more as you go through graduate school. So my master's is in marine biology, but my undergraduate degree is biology in general. That's so unintuitive to not like majoring marine biology hurt you. So this is the thing I rant about a lot on social media that so many undergraduate students, particularly first generation college students that don't have anyone in their family who's done this before. There's a lot of stuff that sort of no one knows unless you know it. And sort of you have to be in the club to know the rules of the club type things. But there's no one class you take or one internship you take that guarantees you'll get a job. It's just not how it works. Yeah, I completely agree with that. That's why with our episode titles, I've been very careful for it not to be like how to become a journalist, but it's like how I became a journalist. Yes, that's exactly right. And there's value in knowing that. The sort of stuff I'm doing now, about half my time, I'm running a scientific and environmental communications consulting firm that I founded. And that's not something that most other people could do. It's skills that I learned in side projects during graduate school and at classes I took at conferences. And it's basically based on what's been a hobby for the last little while is now my primary source of income. But I'm also still a part-time postdoc and I teach, I teach marine biology at Arizona State. So I have elements of a traditional path, but also some stuff that's in there that I can't really say you should just do this because if I didn't know all the people I know, if I didn't take the classes on policy that I took, if I didn't have an environmental attorney for a friend. I wouldn't know this stuff and wouldn't be any good at this. It turns out there wasn't a job doing this stuff that I wanted to do. So I made one and incorporated and have been seeking clients. I love your mission to educate others on like general ways they could become marine biologists or figure it out. Is that why your Twitter has 50,000 followers? Is it mostly from these education efforts? I'd say that's maybe one to 3% of the sort of stuff I talk about. Most of what I talk about is just sort of look at this cool thing about sharks that you probably didn't know. I would say most of my tweets either start with, here's a cool thing that you maybe didn't know that I just learned, or this thing that everybody's talking about this week is wrong. Uh, And that's, so it's a mix of that. But also I do live tweeting and fact checking in real time of Shark Week specials and things like that. Every week, I do an hour where I answer any questions that anyone has and ask me anything session on Twitter. Though during the pandemic, I've been switching to doing those on Facebook Live, which has been a lot of fun. 
So yeah, just sharing information about science and conservation and ways people can help. Very little of what I share is my own research because a lot of people just, first of all, there's not enough of it to fill enough tweets to do everything I talk about. But also the technical details are just not that interesting to people and that's fine. So I'm mostly talking about cool things that my colleagues did. Okay, so most of your following is just shark fans or something. People who think the ocean is neat. We actually did an analysis of this for a science communication research project that there's this misconception that if you're doing public science education online, you're only talking to other scientists. And that's demonstrably not true. There absolutely are a lot of scientists on social media, and it can be a great way to meet other scientists. You're actually the first scientist I've met with like a huge following. And from my experience, most I've met don't really use social media. Yeah. I also train scientists all over the world how to do this. I've trained almost 600. That's great. Because yeah. they're doing such good, they just don't know how to market themselves. So yep. you're training them how to market themselves? Yep. What does your training involve? Yeah. It's a half-day professional development workshop, which I can do remotely over Zoom or Skype or whatever, but mostly it's in person, either before or after I give a seminar at a university when I travel or during scientific conferences, or some people bring me out just to give this. And it's a lot of fun. They learn the basic theory behind public science education and public science engagement. They learn the basic mechanics of how Twitter works, because a lot of people are sort of familiar with the general benefits of things like Twitter, but they might not necessarily know what a hashtag is or know what a retweet is or know what a thread is. So we go through all that. And then we go through some advanced tips and tricks and I give them guidelines on what to do next and things like that. And how to increase their following. Yeah. About two thirds of my trainees stick with Twitter in some capacity, or at least have told me that they have. Yeah. I, I think that's really cool you're doing that because from my experience in the tech industry, the people who are really good at booking conferences and like marketing themselves and giving speeches, getting featured articles, they're usually the people with no substance who haven't done anything really in tech. Because they're just good marketing themselves. And the people who are legit are too busy making their companies to like promote themselves. So I think it's cool you're giving people of real substance th this power to be like well known. Oh, wait, I had a quick pivot. What was life like as a grad student in marine biology? I enjoyed graduate school. It's the only time where you're just paid to just sit there and learn as much as you can about a topic and do like sometimes literally nothing other than that. So it's a neat way of doing things. It's certainly long hours for little pay and there's a lot of stress. And there are certainly aspects of graduate school that aren't great, but I had a very positive graduate school experience. And in general, doing marine biology research means you're spending a few weeks a year out in the field. So out on a boat, in my case, fishing for sharks, measuring sharks, putting telemetry tracker tags on sharks, drawing blood and muscle tissue from sharks to analyze in the lab later. I was also taking classes and also being a TA, writing up your results and publishing it in scientific journals is a process I actually really like, though there are parts of it that are very frustrating. Attending and presenting at scientific conferences is great. I now travel all over the place to give seminars, which are some departments host a weekly seminar series where the whole department gets together to watch and they invite someone from a different place every week to come give a talk. I just, right before this interview, I just gave a virtual seminar over Zoom, which is significantly less fun because when it's over, you don't go out to the bar with everyone. I'm just in my office by myself. It still counts as a, giving a seminar and I still enjoy it. So I liked graduate school, but it's a lot of time. My master's program was three years. And then after that is my PhD. And in my case was five and a half years, but it can be much longer than that. And that's before you can apply for a postdoctoral fellowship, which is what I have now. And you need at least one of those. I'm on my second now before you can apply for faculty jobs. So in his toast at the rehearsal dinner at our wedding, my dad joked that at the time I was in 24th grade. So it's a lot of school. It's more school than medical school. It's more school than law school. It's more school than business school. So it's a lot of time in school, but I enjoy it. Can you explain the difference between the program? Sure. So um, to be a university faculty member or a government agency head or someone running your own lab, running your own research program somewhere, you need a PhD. That's a doctorate. And a master's, you don't, you can still get some jobs. And there are some jobs that they won't hire you if you have a PhD because they have to pay you more to do the same stuff. So depending on what you want to do, you might not need a PhD. But for the stuff I want to do, you need a PhD. And the question of if you know you want a PhD, do you get a master's first is an age old question that is as yet unresolved. I had two advisors in college and one said, if you know you want to get a PhD, 
you absolutely must get a master's first. And the other said, if you know you want a PhD, it's a total waste of time to get a master's first. And it's pretty even split in the biology community about that. I liked getting a master's first because the first part of graduate school is sort of just learning how to be a scientist. And I was having done that during my master's, I could hit the ground running during my PhD. And that was nice. There are some graduate programs that require a master's before you're getting a PhD. Many don't. There are some advisors that require it, though many don't. And there's also a newer thing called a professional master's or MPS degree. That's designed for if you want to be a mid-level bureaucrat at a government agency or if you want to work for an environmental nonprofit group but not be in charge of the environmental nonprofit group. Yeah. You were saying you learned how to become a scientist. Mm -hmm. Like what does that involve? What kind of skills? I'm actually very curious what your sure. research projects were. Yeah. Yeah. So the things that you do in graduate school, you're in charge of a research project. You're the scientist who's running a research project. You get a budget. You might have personnel working under you that you supervise. You get equipment that's yours. You're responsible for learning how to do everything. You're responsible for making sure it works. You're responsible for troubleshooting when it doesn't work. You have an advisor who helps you with all that stuff, but they're not holding your hand. Do you pick the topic? It depends. There are some graduate schools where you can't pick the topic. I, as a faculty member, for example, could write a grant that says, and I am going to study the migration of winter flounder off the coast of Virginia. And I want two master students to help me with that. And then I would advertise, hey, I have two fully funded master student positions. You will be studying the migration ecology of winter flounder off Virginia. So you can't then come in and say, I want to study dolphins in Australia. No, your job is you're hired to do this exact thing, winter flounder in Virginia. But there are other cases where that's not the case, where you do get more freedom over what you want to study. And I intentionally chose programs where I got to create the project in collaboration with my advisory team to know what was feasible and what was doable and what was worth doing. But it was absolutely things that I wanted to do. And for my master's, I studied the feeding ecology and behavior of sandbar sharks, which are, if you follow me on social media, I call them hashtag best shark. If you search hashtag best shark, you'll see years of me talking about how much I love sandbar sharks and years of other more senior scientists teasing me for picking what they perceive to be a boring and lame shark as uh, the best shark. It's also my corporate logo for my consultancy. Oh, so, <laughs> Wait, how do you pick ideas for a research project and how do you narrow it down? How do you know what's a good research project? So there are identified research priorities. Sometimes these come from government agencies, sometimes from other scientists, sometimes from nonprofit groups. And these are available. People have said, like, we need to know this. And you can come up with a project that sort of fits within that theme. And in this case, I was looking at what's called ecosystem-based fisheries management. The general principle of this is we need more data on how everything in the food chain interacts with each other in order to have smart fisheries design. So, And sandbar sharks, I knew to be a well-studied species that we could definitely get lots of enough to get the data I needed. And I knew that no one had done this kind of work on them before. So they were a perfect fit for this. So I'll give you an, an example of choosing a project poorly. I had a classmate who was working on parasites that live within a particular rare species of whale. And there are two populations of this species of whale, one that live up in the Cape Cod area and one that lives in like the Florida region. And she needed to get the data that she needed to do her master's degree. She needed 10 whales to strand on the Cape Cod region that she could get parasites from and 10 that she needed to strand in Florida that she could get parasites from. And after she announced this project, I said, oh, that's cool. How many of these whales stranded last year? And she said, oh, none of them have stranded in about five years. So how are you planning on getting the data? It turns out she dropped out of grad school. So you have to pick a feasible project and a good advisor should help with that. Like everyone goes in saying, I'm going to do the most amazing work ever and it's going to change the world. You don't, you don't need to do that in your master's research. You need to demonstrate that you know how to do science, that you know how to design a project and carry out a project and collect data scientifically and analyze it statistically and write it up well. If you do that, you're going to get a master's degree, even if your project is not particularly exciting. Though I was happy that mine has been very well received. Can we walk back to the project you chose on sandbar sure. sharks and how you went about creating idea, doing the research and like getting results and Sure. Yeah. So I went to the College of Charleston in South Carolina and it's a very unusual marine biology program because there's about 40 students and about 500 faculty. And that's because 
there are a bunch of research labs from different government and state agencies and other universities, all in this complex where everything's walkable from one another, which means there's probably someone nearby who does something that you might be interested in. And they're all potentially available to be an advisor. So it's a great setup. You have a lot of freedom. Turns out there was no one who was there who was a shark person. But there was someone who was there who was a fish ecologist who was interested in sharks, although had not worked on them before. So he became my advisor. And then I worked with him to find a team to fill in the gaps in knowledge between us. I used a method for studying the shark diet. We used a method called stable isotope analysis. I won't get into it in detail. It's very mathy and chemistry and don't worry about it. But we found someone who knew how to do that who was based at the College of Charleston campus at the Fort Johnson Marine Science Complex there, a couple buildings over. So he became on the team and so on and so on. It was very easy. The most expensive part of marine science research is paying for boat time. You I was going to say like shark yeah. fishing. What is that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just what it sounds like, except you don't use a rod and reel. You use uh, more complicated fishing gear that can catch a lot of sharks at once. Like a big net. <laughs> I can't even visualize. We use traditionally in shark research, you use what's called a long line, which is a long length of rope. As every sailor knows, as soon as rope gets on a boat, it's magically called a line, but is otherwise identical. So it's a long length of rope that has tons of baited hooks coming off it. And on one on either end there's an anchor and on either end there's a float. So you deploy that for an hour and then reel it in. And the one we used had I think 50 hooks and we'd usually catch five to ten sharks on it each time. They also have a longer long line that had, I think, 500 hooks and that we would either catch a few sharks or there's one particular kind of shark off South Carolina that if you catch one, you catch 50 of them. They're just sort of sitting on the boat and you measure them. There's a bunch of different measurements you take of not just their length, but their girth, their height, how far apart different parts of their body are. And that's useful for understanding how healthy they are. We also take blood, which I analyzed later in the lab for that stable isotope stuff, take a little muscle biopsy, take a little bit of skin. We can use that to get their DNA for a method called population genetics. And you can also put a tracker tag on them that whenever their fin breaks the surface, it talks to a satellite in orbit. It tells you where the shark is anywhere in the world. You don't use that on every shark because one of those tags is three or $4,000. The most expensive part of this is paying for the boat time. So by joining an existing survey and saying, hey, you catch sandbar sharks sometime, can I come out with you? And whenever you catch a sandbar shark, I take a muscle plug from it. And the rest of the time, anything else you catch, I'll help you with what you need. My Department of Natural Resources scientist colleagues answer to that was, wait, and I don't have to pay you for this? You're just going to like, you're going to do a bunch of work and I don't have to do anything different. Yeah, sure. That's awesome. Okay. Naive question. Did you ever fear for your safety? I have never been bitten by a shark. I've been bitten at a lot. So we tell people in general, sharks not going to bother you unless you bother them. As scientists, we're bothering them. You have to be very careful. And if you're careful and if you're aware of where they are and you treat them with respect and don't let your guard down, you're going to be very safe. I have colleagues who have been injured by sharks. They all got cocky. Said, I've been around thousands of sharks. This one's little, whatever. It's not going to hurt me. And they get cocky and then it bites them on the arm. And even a little shark can mess up your day. My natural instinct is to like not want to put myself in danger. There's just not much danger with it. The animals are secured by a team of scientists. They can barely move. We just make sure that they're secure without hurting them. Or how do you love an animal that could potentially injure you? I don't think I can even grasp that, actually. Love is the wrong word, I think, because, yeah, they are dangerous. Like, they do hurt people sometimes very, 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 very rarely, but it can happen. I respect them. I'm in awe of them. I recognize their importance to the planet. And without them, the world is not only a less interesting place, but it's a less healthy place. So predators help keep the food chain in balance, and we need them we shouldn't be part of the food chain. I don't wish to be bitten or eaten, though I actually do have draft language in my will in case I am actually killed by a shark, though it's probably more like that my diet is going to do me in. (laughs) Yeah, I, I just don't see it as dangerous. There are a few times when I felt unsafe, but those have all been boat related rather than shark related. Gotcha. There have been times when we've been out in rougher weather than we should have been out in. We should have just not gone fishing that day. Okay, so you gather samples from the shark. What do you do Mm -hmm. with them? How do you learn about the food cycle from that? 
Yeah. So the basic premise of stable isotope analysis is you've heard the cliche, you are what you eat. Yes. On a molecular level, that's literally true. When you eat something and digest it and grow, you are incorporating molecules of that something into yourself. And you can trace the natural radioactive signature of different prey items and a predator and determine this is eating 40% open ocean fish and 60% seafloor crabs and shrimp. And you can do that just from a few drops of blood. And that helps you sort of map out the food chain and how the predators interact with each other and interact with the food chain. It's a way of doing that that doesn't involve killing the animal because the old way of figuring out what a shark ate would be to cut it in half and see what fell out like you see in things like Jaws. That's really how they used to do it. So these newer non-lethal methods, there's a lot of math and computer programming involved. But from my perspective, I draw blood, I freeze it, I send it off to a lab, and I get an Excel spreadsheet in the mail. These kind of projects, they, they take a long time. Is that why your PhD program is five years? Yes. Makes sense. So a master's is typically one or two research projects, and a PhD is usually four or five that are related. But the goal is to get multiple peer-reviewed scientific journal publications out of them. If you just do the research and then don't tell anyone, there's really no point and you wasted everyone's time and a bunch of grant money. So the goal of science is to get everything published in a peer-reviewed journal. So this is where you first learn how to market yourself, kind of. Yes. So you mentioned, is there more school after that? After your PhD, you have typically what's called a postdoctoral fellowship, which is sort of like an apprenticeship under a more senior scientist before you become a faculty member yourself. So I did my undergrad at Duke in North Carolina, then my master's at the College of Charleston in South Carolina, and then my PhD in Miami, Florida, and then my first postdoc in British Columbia in Vancouver. And now I'm on my second postdoc in Washington, D.C. It has been a lot of driving, let me tell you, moving every few years. So I am lucky to have a wife who is able to find work wherever we go and is willing to uproot herself like this. We had to have that relationship talk very early in the relationship about what my next decade of life is going to be like. And then you become a faculty member, which what does that mean? That's a professor. So that's a full-time secure job at a college or university. And hopefully it means not moving every few years anymore. I'll let you know if we got that far. Is professor usually the goal for everyone? Does everyone want to teach? A lot of people do. It's certainly not the goal for everyone. And the thing to, get to consider is that the average faculty member will produce one other faculty member in their lifetime because it's not like we're founding more universities all the time. There's not a lot of jobs. You have to wait for someone to retire or sometimes in my case, they are founding new departments related to some of the stuff I do or new centers. It's like being a judge. Like yeah. Yeah. But you have to wait for a spot to become available. So a lot of people work for government agencies. A lot of people work for environmental nonprofit groups. A lot of people sort of become postdocs forever. And some people sort of leave science entirely. But yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I have sort of a foot in the door. And I've been teaching this class that I designed at Arizona State, that introduction to marine biology. This is their last week. They're taking their finals tomorrow. That's been a lot of fun. But I'm what's called an adjunct faculty member. So that's not a full-time secured tenure job. That's meant for someone who has a job elsewhere. You give like a day or two of a week of your time to this other job. When does the uh, quote money come in? Like you feel less like a student and more like a like I'll let you job. know. <laughs> So right now I'm making a lot more money from my consulting and contract work than I will even as a starting faculty member if I get a position in that world. So getting a more secure job at this point would be a significant pay cut. But that's okay. We're lucky and fortunate that we're a two-income household and we have some savings. My brother, right out of college, he eventually went and got a, an MBA. But before he did that, he was waking way more money than I will as a faculty member just right out of college in the business world. So this is not a job you go into for uh, dreams of riches. I, I certainly make enough to live comfortably. Like we go on vacation. We don't just eat ramen. I like our apartment. Were there any struggles along the way? Did you find any research projects very difficult to do? There are some every now and then that just don't go the way you want. And that's okay. Uh, sometimes it's because you don't get the grants that you applied for that would have paid for it. Certainly that's happened a lot. The National Science Foundation, which is the primary research funding body for non-human health research in the U.S., has for my division, the Division of Ocean Sciences, it has like a 3 to 5% funding rate, which means out of every 33 applications that they get, they fund one of them. And writing one of those grants is like several weeks of work. Yeah. So that's frustrating. I need to learn you how know. to be good at sales and writing for that, yes. really. Yeah. Uh huh. 
So if you don't get a grant, that means that you're probably not doing that project or at least not doing it now. Sometimes you just have this great, brilliant plan and you get out in the field and, oh, it doesn't work. The animal doesn't behave like we thought it was going to. Or we spent all this time and all this money to get to this particular spot and the species isn't here. So there's certainly things that can happen along the way. I have been lucky that I, and also sort of strategic, I mentioned earlier that I picked sandbar sharks as my study animal because I knew no one had done this kind of work with them and that this shark survey that I could tag along with was catching them a lot. So there was little risk of not getting useful data from yeah, that. Yeah, you project. did that on purpose. Yeah. I did that. It was very strategic. Cool. So when did you start moving on from doing just research to also doing consultants, speeches? Last summer. I finished my first postdoc, which was in Vancouver, and then we moved to the Washington, D.C. area. And... I have sort of always been doing this kind of communications consulting and strategy stuff on the side a little bit, but then I incorporated and have been doing a little bit here and there on the side. I also do a lot of freelance journalism. I write about science for the Washington Post, for Scientific American. I have a monthly column in Scuba Diving Magazine, things like that. I've been doing that for a decade now, and now it's just sort of more organized and doing more of it. Can you elaborate on science meets policy? Sure. So a lot of scientists, so in conservation biology, the sort of work that I do, I'm not just trying to understand why an endangered species eats a certain thing. There's a reason why we want to know that. It's because it's an endangered species and we want to learn as much as we can to help change the rules, to help protect it, to help it not be an endangered species anymore. So doing that requires not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge. It's a very applied question rather than pure science, which is, wow, it's so cool that they have this weird protein in their blood that lets them adapt to this. Oh, well, they're extinct now. So it's done in consultation with management agencies that they say, we need to know this about this species. Some scientist somewhere should study this. And then once it's done, you don't just publish it in a peer-reviewed scientific journal that no one ever reads and stop. You have to then communicate it to the management agency and communicate it to fishermen that are the ones that need to change their behavior and communicate it to an environmental group. So this is a really important step. And the thing that I tell my scientific colleagues is I'm not saying you don't do science. I'm just saying doing the science is not the end. That's step one. A question that I ask people in some of my professional development training seminars is they're usually primarily academic scientists in the audience. And I say, all right, raise your hand if you can name five other scientists anywhere in the world who do the same sort of research that you do. And everyone raises their hand. And then I say, raise your hand if you can name five journalists who regularly write about the sort of research that you do. And like half of them raise their hand. And I say, raise your hand if you know five environmental nonprofit groups that lobby for policy change in your area of the world. And maybe a quarter of them raise their hand. And then I say, raise your hand if you know the names of people who work for those environmental nonprofit groups who you can call them and say, I have a new paper that will help you. And they will know who you are. And one or two people raise their hand. And then I say, raise your hand if you know the name of the government employee who's going to be responsible for making the new rules based on about your species. And no one raises their hand. And then I say, you need to know all this if you want your research to be significant in terms of environmental policy change. Or you need to know people who know all this. How did you get known? How did you do it? Just putting myself out there, attending meetings and saying yes to opportunities and asking questions and sometimes just brute force and ignorance, not showing up where I maybe shouldn't have been, but people were very kind and welcoming. You should have a business where you just connect the scientists with the policymakers. That's that's a lot of what I'm doing. I sort of see myself as a switchboard operator a lot of times. I have to know people in every section and I have to know who knows what and who needs what. And when someone comes to me and says, I need your help get learning about this issue. Oh, I know this scientist. She can help you with this and call her and put them in touch. I absolutely do a lot of that. That's key. Yeah. How do you validate if someone's a good researcher? I've heard you say my research was well received, but like, what does that mean? (laughs) Sometimes that means it's cited by other scientists. Sometimes that means it wins awards. Some of my works won awards, the most downloaded paper in the journal that year, things like that. If you're approached by other scientists who say, I'd like to build off what you did, we want to join, or is it okay with you if I do that? Would you mind sharing your raw data? Or just people email me and say, I read your paper. I liked it. Thanks. Which is great. 
I wish more people would do that. And I try to do that all the time because I know how great it makes me feel when someone I don't know just says, hey, I don't have a question. I just read your new paper and I liked it. Good job. But yeah, a good scientist for the types of issues I work on, there's someone who is knowledgeable and not needlessly controversial and is also a good communicator. If they know their stuff, but they're so smart that you wouldn't have a goddamn clue what they were talking about if they tried to explain it, that's not useful. That's not someone who's a good fit for my needs. So I know a lot of these people from the science communication world that I know, oh, you're a great scientist who talks about hyenas on Twitter. So there's a lot like that. So you just build up a network. I actually have a literal Rolodex just because I appreciate the nostalgia there. But I've always been a sort of networker. What's your favorite shark joke you've read on Twitter? My favorite shark joke. Oh, man, there just aren't a lot of great shark jokes. My favorite fish joke is what do you call a fish with no eye? Uh, fish. Oh. Just F-S-H. But that oh, yeah. doesn't work with shark. I tried it with sh, but it doesn't work because it's an A, not an I. Aren't a ton of great shark jokes out there, sadly. I share sort of sarcastic shark facts as well as real shark facts. And one that was very popular recently was most great white sharks are actually mediocre white sharks. They're just very confident. <laughs> so things, okay. Things like that. Classic. What's your favorite and least favorite thing about your job? My favorite thing about being a scientist is sometimes, a few times a year, I get to be the first human ever anywhere in the world to know something because I'm the one who found it. And then the next part of my job is to tell everyone else what I found and why I think it's so cool. That never gets old. My least favorite thing about the job is not even the pay, just the insecurity of it. I mean, we've moved five times in the last seven years. That's hard. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to have geographic stability. It's hard to think about starting a family. You have to make new friends all the time. And we've been very lucky that we've found great friends everywhere we've lived. But it's hard. Yeah. Do you think there's a better system out there? Do you think there needs oh, God, to be there this must much be. switch in education? So it's generally considered to be bad form. So I mentioned earlier you do an undergraduate degree and a master's degree and a PhD and a postdoc. It is generally considered bad form to do any two of those at the same place. So that system naturally encourages you to move all the time. I had a colleague who was a postdoc on three different continents in a five-year period. That sucks. Unless you enjoy traveling. I Unless mean. you enjoy travel, but it's hard to convince a life partner to join you on all those adventures. And you have to make new friends all the time, and you can't even bring your stuff with you. You can only bring what you can check on a flight. So yeah, there's got to be a better way, but damn if I know what it is. It would be nice just if there were more jobs available. It would be nice if the sort of communications and outreach work I do was more valued by those jobs. There are certainly some that think it's great, but there are some that say just hear Twitter and think that it's silly and there's no point in it. I'm followed by my congressmen and my senators on Twitter and they talk to me. Like there's value in having that. But using Twitter, I was able to get my PhD research covered in National Geographic. There's value in that. Not to mention amplifying important conservation issues and amplifying the work of my colleagues and things like that. But there are people that just go, oh, Twitter, that's silly. That's where people talk about Justin Bieber and sourdough recipes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it'll change. I think there'll be more and more people doing the sort of stuff that I'm doing with sort of creating my own space. But it's tricky. Has quarantine affected your career at all? For me, it's actually been good. There's a lot of demand for uh, distance science education type stuff these days. So I've been talking with school groups every day of quarantine. Next week, I'm going to reach 50 states that I've reached, all 50. So I've been doing a lot of that. I can do my professional development training workshops online. I was already working from home two or three days a week. So that's not that big a deal. So I had a home office set up separate from the rest of the house, which is great. So Stacy is now working from home because her office is closed. So we can be in separate rooms and not drive each other nuts while we're working. That's nice. But I'm missing the opportunity to go to scientific conferences, which is where I generate a lot of business. And also there are a lot of fun job interviews happen at those. Several of the faculty jobs I applied for canceled their search this year because they just couldn't deal with it during the pandemic. Whereas others maybe continued, but I don't know if they did because things got so disrupted. They forgot to tell people if they got the job or not. Uh, or at least they forgot to tell the people who didn't get the job. So yeah, it's a disruption. I also can't go out on a boat and collect new data. I've already missed two trips to do that. But the biggest thing has been the loss of conferences. Yeah, I feel. 
I'm very more the merrier. So this yes. goes against all my natural instincts. Uh, yep. All right. Got to ask. See, so you're wearing a Shark Week shirt. Yep. <laughs> what are your feelings in Shark Week? <laughs> They're not positive that they do make damn comfy shirts. Google my name in Shark Week later and see what comes up. My feelings about Shark Week are not positive. It is a egregious offender of misinformation and disinformation about sharks. And they could be doing so much good that Shark Week is the largest temporary increase in Americans paying attention to any science topic of the year. Yeah, easily. And they use it to talk nonsense. For no reason. I'm not saying that nonfiction TV needs to be science class, but they could do basic fact checking and they could not make up lies <laughs> and they could not like it's egregious. In the recent past, they've actively lied to scientists to get them to appear on shows. They tell them that the show is about something. And then when it airs a bit, it's about something nonsense. And they edit the scientists interviews to make it look like they're responding to questions that they were never asked. Oh, that should be illegal. It is in the UK. Really? Cool. <laughs> it's not here. Shark Week is definitely not great, though. They have occasionally do have good quality stuff. I would say the median show is bad, which is better than five years ago when the median quality show was horrific. I haven't given an F minus in a, in a while. I watch and evaluate all the shows, and I think I, there may have been one F minus this year. Shark Week is not good. And so many people to think that it is because it's the Discovery Channel. It's nonfiction education. And they approach me after I give a talk and they say, well, you said this at your public talk, Mr. Shark Expert, but the Discovery Channel said that. Show me a peer-reviewed source written by experts that confirms what they're saying. I'm still holding out hope that they'll stop being so bad. They're definitely getting better. So for your Twitter live stream, are you usually just pointing out the inaccuracies? Yes. <laughs> nice. Increasingly sarcastically. Some of my favorite media coverage ever about me was Vox, the internet news site, just took several of my tweets out of context on various days of Shark Week. And the title of the article is, Watch as Shark Week Drives This Scientist Insane. <laughs> oh, like God. Monday, like, well, actually, they said this and so-and-so. And then by Friday, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> That's so unfair. Would that make you feel bad? No, I thought it was hysterical. Shark Week is not a force for good in the science education space. And they could be. They have the audience. I mean, look at the success of things like Planet Earth, the most popular documentary series ever. And it's true. You don't need to make up nonsense and have fear-mongering exaggeration in order to get people to watch. Yeah, it's time for you to hit up their producers and execs and love yeah. them. <laughs> Is there a biggest career mistake you've ever made? The biggest thing that I've ever done that I regret was not research related, but the outreach side. I don't consider myself a science journalist most of the time. I consider myself a science cheerleader or science popularizer. My job is to say, look at this cool new thing I learned rather than do deep dive investigative reporting. Once I did a deep dive investigative report of some misconduct by another senior scientist in my field, and they did something wrong, and I documented it, and I talked about it, and I shouldn't have done that. They were absolutely wrong and someone should have done that, but it should not have been a graduate student in that person's field because they have the power to retaliate. So that's something that I teach in my public science engagement workshops that does this need to be said? Does this need to be said by you? Does this need to be said by you now? If it needs to be said, but not by you, then that's what the relationships with journalists are for. You can say, I have an anonymous story tip for you. You should look into this. These documents fell off a truck. So yeah, I regret talking about that in the way that I did, though I was right and they were wrong. Having someone who has power over you and is vindictive is not great. Yeah. Something I tell myself a lot when I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? Just yes. whisper it to myself. Yep. So Pick your better. battles. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. mean compromising your moral integrity or whatever. It means, you know, I can only care about five things this week and maybe that's not one of the things. Okay. So... For others out there who are interested in the ocean and they think they want to make a career out of it, how would you, one, advise them on how to figure out which type of field or job specifically to get and two, how to get there? <laughs> yeah. So I get career questions a lot from my social media followers. And one of the ones I get is, I want to be like you and help save the ocean. If you want to help save the ocean, you want to be an environmental advocate. You don't want to be a marine biologist. Those are different jobs. Both are good. Both are important. Both can be very rewarding. Both have a lot of the same strengths and weaknesses in terms of career satisfaction versus pay. 
but it's not the same thing. And if you apply for a job as a marine biologist saying, I want to use science to save the world, you're not going to get the job because your job as a scientist is to find objective truth, which is not the same thing. So understanding what you want to be doing is important. And there's a lot of great online resources about this. And there's also a lot of misleading nonsense about this. So you had to be really careful. But there's all these marine biology Facebook groups. And I see people all the time saying, hey, I'm not a marine biologist. Thanks for letting me join this group. I'm going to ask career advice and make major life decisions based on this advice from strangers without realizing, huh, they let me be a member of this group without being a marine biologist. Maybe the other people in the group aren't either. Yeah, but that's the only resources they have. The bigger issue is people who have no idea and they say, oh, you should do this. If someone's asking you for life advice and you don't know, then don't guess. Yeah. So how do you figure it out? Which field do you want to do? So having a sense of what exactly you want your day to be like is helpful. Do you want to be a scientist? Do you want to be an educator? Do you want to be a government official? Do you want to be an environmental advocate? Do you want to be a science journalist? Or lots of things. So knowing that will help. Knowing which of those you want to do helps. And then within each of those, there's a ton of different subfields and subdisciplines. The best thing you could do is follow reliable experts on social media and see the sort of stuff they do, read the things they recommend, ask good, thoughtful questions, but not what college should I go to. There's a ton of helpful resources that are out there about this. And people act like they have to guess. And you don't have to guess. If you're already in college, talking to your undergraduate advisor or your career center is an incredibly valuable resource. Some high schools have these too, though many don't. But even without that, there's a ton of free online resources that tell you what's a typical day like in each of these jobs. What does it pay? What will your employers be like? What do you need in order to do this? And if any of that, if you read through that and you think, well, that sounds great, then track down some people who have that job and talk to them. And if you read through it and say, part of this sounds great, but part of this, I'd be miserable, maybe look for something else. Because I know people who say, I love some parts of science, but I hate writing up data and writing peer-reviewed publications. I mean, that's, if you don't do that, you're not going to get a job in most science. But that's why I find those online job descriptions very unhelpful, because it's usually like a Many paragraph. Yeah. And it's not going to be like, oh, a scientist usually has to like, look up research and publish papers. Like you don't even yeah. read that part. So how are you supposed to know what the job really entails? So there are better ones that are out there. And marine biology specifically has some good ones from the U.S. government, from NOAA, from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is the UC San Diego marine biology program, from various senior scientists. The information is definitely there. I just had to dig it up to send to my marine biology students. There's certainly a lot of just sort of generic, unhelpful advice, like what you're describing, but the real stuff's there and it's not too hard to find. Step one is figuring out what exactly you want to do, which is not the same thing as just saying, I love the ocean, so I'm going to be a marine biologist. If you love the ocean, you could hate 90% of what is involved in marine biology. So this is not a job that you pursue for the fame. This is not a job you pursue for the money. This is a job you pursue because you can't imagine doing anything else. And if you can imagine doing something else where there would be more other benefits that you'd like, then we'll miss you and maybe come talk to me when I give public talks and you can get scratch your marine biology itch that way. I don't want to discourage anyone from pursuing their dreams, but I want you to think broadly and deeply about what your dream is. Any other advice you give to aspiring marine biologists? Just know that you like science and doing science, not just watching science, not just watching science documentaries, like the actual work of doing science. It's often not particularly glamorous. It can be long hours. It can be very smelly chemicals. It can be things that absolutely destroy your clothing. Tiger shark slime, by the way, is a very, very excellent way to totally destroy a bathing suit if you get tiger shark slime on you. So there are some aspects of it that are not particularly glamorous. You should know what an actual typical day is like and not just like, I saw this cool picture on the internet of someone having doing the best part of their job. Therefore, I assume that the job is all that. Cool. So we reached the end of our interview. So I was wondering, we usually give our guests 60 seconds to pitch anything they want. Anything sure. you want to pitch? Well, I don't know when this is going to air, but if it's going to air anytime soon, I'm making myself available to Zoom or Skype or whatever with 
kids that are home with schools closed. So if teachers want to reach out to me that are still in touch with their classes virtually, why sharks matter at Gmail. There's no charge for public schools and I'll come talk to your kids for an hour about sharks and marine biology and answer their questions. And for anyone else, if you want to learn more about any of this, I am at Why Sharks Matter on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And I'm always happy to answer any questions anyone has. Hey, guys. Hope you enjoyed our interview with the brilliant Dr. David Schiffman. I particularly loved his tips on who should actually become a marine biologist and which advice you should be ignoring when looking for career advice. I know myself, I've struggled with filtering out terrible advice when it came to figuring out my career, and I thought he gave some really good tips there. You can find links to anything mentioned in the episode in our show notes at thenewschoolpodcast.com slash episodes. Stick around till the end to hear a sneak peek of next week's episode. To stay up to date on content, make sure to follow us on Instagram at the New School Podcast and on Twitter at The New School Pod. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, you could find your review on a future The New School episode. Do you feel like you or someone else would be an amazing guest on our show? If yes, please contact us on our website, thenewschoolpodcast.com slash contact. Want your ultimate guide on how to turn your passions into a meaningful career? Subscribe to our weekly newsletter at thenewschoolpodcast.com. The New School with Christine Hong is produced by Jenny Snyder and Shristi Biani. Editing by Sydney Salk, John Simpson, and Joseph Cho. Video editing by Josh Stanley. Special thanks to our marketing team who help us spread our mission and put the New School name out there. Katie Osaki, Emma Borgerding, Giovanni Cortez, Cynthia Shao, Dina Che, and Marissa Wolfsheimer. Next week, look out for Emily Johnson as she explains how to climb the public relations ladder. She began her career in PR interning with a woman known as the Oscar Whisperer because she helped market films to win major awards, including the Oscars. Emily has also worked with major clients such as Netflix, Prime Video, Ward of Astoria, The Hilton, and Marriott International. Like I worked with Matthew McConaughey and Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt. I managed these events. I was their escort. I was making sure that they were getting the interviews that they needed. As an unpaid intern, like doing that and handling that caliber of clientele is insane. My favorite moment was I was backstage. I smelled something. I was like, what is that? And I look over and Brad Pitt, John Berman, and Logan are all just sitting in a circle just smoking a joint. Okay. And I was just like, that... This is crazy. I moved out to LA and I'm watching Brad Pitt smoke. <laughs> Come back next Monday to find out from Emily how to break into the PR world, the different types of work involved in PR, and if Samantha Jones from Sex and the City is actually an accurate depiction of what working in PR is like. All right, guys, have a great day. Try something new today.